Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. Hello and welcome to howtoexit.com. Uh, today I'm here with Cliff Spallender. He's the CEO of Business by Design in the UK. It's the UK's leading planning and advisory company. He's also the author of The Smarter Exit, a growth and exit plan for your business, and the author of The Cash Flow Code, Six Keys to Unlocking Your Ultimate Cash Flow. Thank you for being on the show today, Cliff. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So you're over in the UK. I appreciate you being on here. Uh, it's 9 a.m. in the morning where I'm at. What, where are you at right now? Just gone quarter past five in the afternoon. Okay. Well, let's just start with like, kind of get to know you, man. Like uh, I always joke around and say, hey, you were born. Now you ended up on my show. Like, Can you fill out the gap in between? How did you get to be a business advisor? That's a, a great question. Ron. I, I suppose um, from the very beginning, I'm, I'm from South Africa originally. And uh, I suppose... The whole journey kind of started for me back in November, probably 1989. And uh, we were at the airport uh, saying goodbye to my dad. And uh, we had my mom, my brother, my little sister, my grandparents were there. And uh, he was uh, going off to fight. He was a a pilot in the Air Force and he was going off to fight in Angola because we were at war with the Cubans and the Russians at the time. And uh, at that time, when I said goodbye to my father, my mother said to me, look, say goodbye to him because um, you're probably not going to see him again. He's going on a three-month operation, which meant that he may not come back. And as I saw my father walk down the concourse, I realized that, you know, uh, I'm on my own, really. Um, the last thing he, he said to me was, you know, Cliff, you are now the man of the house. You need to take care of your mother, your brother, and your, and your baby sister. And at that point in time, I think it was nine, um, I realized that life is quite lonely. Um, no one's got my back. And um, I had to grow up very, very fast. Um, I then ended up joining the South African Navy as a weapons officer um, and did my stint there before resigning and then moving to the UK. Um, but then I started my, my kind of my career as an entrepreneur where I've started, bought and sold several companies. I franchised one and licensed another in five countries. And um, through the, this, this probably 22 odd years, um, I've realized being in business is a lonely place. You feel like you're on your own. No one's got your back. Um, very few people, you know, you understand the journey, you, the process you're going on, the journey you're on. And so there are times, like I felt back in 1989, when you do feel all alone and by yourself. And so... Um, and so I began my, my kind of the journey of wanting to help owners um, with, with their journey to make sure that they understand that they're not, they're not on their own, that there are people around who understand, who can support them and, and work through the, the process, the, the process and, and, the, and the position of, of going through, through business. Uh, and so that kind of led me to going for my own companies and then working with, with owners themselves in helping them to strategically grow and then to hopefully at some point in the future, exit successfully. But uh, I joined the military, it was Air Force. So I uh, did Air Force Intelligence about five and a half years. Uh, and then I let, went to the private sector, uh, worked for the government in the private sector for a little while. But yeah, we have a similar thing. And I get the lonely, loneliness of an entrepreneur. It's very common that I want to mm-hmm. pick up the phone in the middle of the day and call somebody and either all my friends are either entrepreneurs and they're busy with their own projects, right? We're not in the same company. Mm-hmm. Or they've got a job and they can't answer the phone during the day. So you're sitting there going, man, you know, I've got one or two military friends that are kind of semi-retired now. I can call them. But usually they just don't understand because they're not entrepreneurial. Right. So uh, it is. It is kind of a uh, there's a little bit of isolation. Even if you've got a company of 100 people, uh, there's some isolation to the fact that you just can't take every issue to, you know, random employees or even friends that have worked for you for 25 years and stuff because a lot of times it causes you know some of these issues you need to deal with and work on like exit planning that's a very uh interesting topic when you're when you've got employees 
right? You just can't go and say, "Hey, I'm thinking about selling this thing. What do you guys think?" You might you might get some uh, feedback on that, that or some people leaving. No, completely. Yeah, when it comes to exit planning, a lot of people want to keep quiet about that because uh, yeah, employees either mm-hmm. can be positive or it can be negative, and you just don't know which way it's going to turn. Right. So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, I know the topic is is uh, something you care a lot about. You wrote a book on like exit planning. So in in your vision, you know, let's talk about exit planning as a business. Uh, when should a business owner even consider that? Or like, what is the process that you want to see entrepreneurs take on in the realm of exit planning? Well, I think from my perspective, exit planning um, is, is just simply good business strategy. That's all it is. It's, a, it's how you grow a business and grow it in such a way that it attracts the, the right buyer should you be selling or it allows you at very least to exit successfully. That's all exit planning really is. And an owner, I believe, and this is, the, this is from my own personal experience, is that you should start planning your exits the day the company starts trading. Uh, failing that, the next best time to start planning your exits is right now. Um, there, and the reason why I say that is because none of us here knows what's around the corner. You know, we could be hit by a bus tomorrow. We just don't know. And unfortunately, I have seen this firsthand where when owners approach me looking to uh, wanting to buy their businesses because they've either had a heart attack or stroke or they've been diagnosed with an illness and they have to leave the business business pretty quickly. Um, unfortunately, when I do look into the business, uh, it's a mess. The financials are everywhere. Um, the employees are, are miserable. The clients are leaving. Basically, the company is unsellable. And in most cases, I can't help those people. So they then have to exit and face the financial consequences of closing the company down or whatever the case is, um, rather than actually focus on dealing with the illness or dealing with whatever personal circumstances that they find themselves in. And so my real motivation is to make people aware that this exit planning is something that will happen to you, whether you want to or not. It's just a question of how to best prepare for that. And every company is different. Every person is different. Every situation is different. So you need to have a process that is, that gives you structure but it's also flexible enough to deal with your personal circumstances. And so my real motivation is to help owners get to that point where they are exit ready. So should the unforeseen happen, and I hope it doesn't, but should it happen, they are best prepared to deal with it. So I get, you know, I used to, I've been, I've only been doing this for about two, two and a half years now. Uh, just took the evergreen away from this podcast show. But uh, the, the, um, I've, I've value, probably looked at and probably evaluated more companies than most people that have done this for a couple, 10 to 15 years, uh, mainly because I was involved in the giant roll-up and we evaluated almost 200 companies in a short period of time. And uh, we just had a really good offer. People were lining up to take it. And uh, anyway, um, that said, I honestly think that a lot of the elements that people need to have to run a great business to, to prepare, like you say, run for exit, uh, to run it as if they're exit is the same thing it takes to run a, a good business. A lot of those elements, when people hear them, they probably should be doing it on a daily, you know, a daily basis anyway. So let's go over your kind of, what is your, like, you meet somebody and they're like, Hey, I've, car- I've got this business. I might sell it someday. What's your advice for, uh, to them? Like, where do they start in running it to exit? That's a, that's a great uh, question, Ron. Basically, um, when I do meet people, um, whether they're wanting to exit in 5, 10, 15 years, time, it's immaterial. Um, what I'm finding is that owners really struggle to understand exactly where they are in their journey. Uh, and so I've broken this, this whole process down into three key plans. You have your business plan, you have your personal plan, and then you have your financial plan. And uh, they both look at different aspects of the owner's life. And it's, you can say it, it's like it's like three legs of a stool. Uh, and uh, in order for, for you to create balance, all three legs have to be looked at and have to be of equal importance to create that stable platform. And so what I do is we undertake a value assessment that assesses how sellable a company is and also how attractive it is. Now, 
attractiveness is really what a company looks like from the outside. That's what a, a buyer tends to see looking at just without doing any DD. Um, it's also how the company is portrayed to a customer. And then business sellability is what a company looks like from the inside. That's when you start to scratch the surface. You look at the finances, look at the, the risk element in the business. So we need to make sure that both the attractiveness and the sellability are saying the same thing. Of course, all too often, I, I see very attractive companies on the outside. But as soon as you start to dig, dig the, the, the surface a bit, you, you find a, a complete mess. And then you, on the personal plan, that's really understanding how prepared the owner is from now until when they exit. So are they prepared for any unexpected life events? That could be divorce, it could be illness, it could be death, unfortunately. Um, also, are they prepared if somebody were to knock on their door and say, hey, I like your business, can I buy it? Are you, are you prepared for that? And then also part of the, the personal plan is understanding what they are going to be doing once they exit the business. Because many owners are finding that you know, they work 40, 50, 60 hours a week in the, in the business and they exit through selling or through whatever means. And then all of a sudden Monday morning comes and they've got all this massive spare time on their hands and they don't know what to do with themselves. Uh, and I also find that owners tend to... Um, when they work in the business for so long, they, their identity starts to be wrapped around the company. And so the company's now gone. They don't know who they are. And so they kind of float around without any sense of purpose. And that sometimes leads to making really bad financial decisions. Um, sometimes it could even affect their mental or physical health. Um, and I've seen owners sometimes even get divorced over it, where the, the wife is completely sick and tired of seeing this husband walking around doing nothing in the pajamas all day. Uh, and so they, they want a better life. Um, and um, unfortunately, some owners even um, for to take, their, take their own life on, on the worst case scenarios. And then it's the, the financial plan. It's you know, how much money do you need to retire in order to live the lifestyle you want without the fear of running out of money? You know, do you know that what that number is? Because the, the owners I speak to don't know what that number is. They say they want to retire at 65 or 60, but I say, well, okay, it's fine. How much money do you have now? And how much money would you need at 60, 65? And they don't know. They have a, some ballpark figure. You know, right. they, don't suck it. they don't quite know. But you need to understand exactly what that number is. Because in that scenario, you have one or two situations. Um, the first one is the owner works um, within the business and looking then looks to sell or exit. And they think they have enough money. But when they when they do the like kind of financial assessment, they realize that they're short. The wealth gap hasn't been met. And so they have to either pare back their standard of living or actually not exit and continue to work until they can afford to exit. And equally sad is that owners who don't measure this sometimes close the gap years ago, but they continue working in the business thinking they need to have more than what they really need when they actually could have exited five, 10 years ago and enjoyed that period of time with their friends and family. And so it's looking at all three plans in, uh, in unison, in, in harmony with each other and how they all feed into each other that creates a successful exit. So yeah. I, I try and, and look at the, the, whole, the whole process in an holistic fashion. Um, let's talk about, like, there's... You're at that stage. You're thinking about exiting and stuff, but it's not where you want it to do. You actually have the uh, cash flow code, which is um, unlocking cash flow. That's one of the the main factors. Uh, profits mm -hmm. and cash flow are the main things people are buying when they buy businesses. Everything's done off of some valuation, some multiple, or some calculation based off of that. So if if you're starting to think about this and you want to maximize that. What are your, uh, can you give us those six keys or do they have to have the book? I mean, can you, can you share that with us today? I can definitely share it with you. And, and the reason why I wrote that book um, was I wrote the book in 2019 20, or 2020, I think it was. Um, and I wrote the book from the, the understanding of what I would have loved to have had in my hand 20 years ago when I first started out in business. Right. And the the reason for that is um, our we, we call them accountants in the UK, but I think you guys call them CPAs, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they all they did for me was do my tax return and my and my VAT. They did nothing else. They didn't help me in any way, shape, or form in terms of how to grow my business, how to evolve my business, and help me to understand what's going on financially. 
And for me, I hadn't got a clue what a balance sheet was or why it was there. I understood the P&L. I looked at the bottom number. If that was positive, I was happy. If it was negative, a bit of an issue. But that's the, the sum total of what my experience was. And the whole thing came about when I spoke to my accountant and said, look, we are really struggling on cash flow. You know, we, you say we're profitable. I think we were, I think we were 8% net profit. So we were, we, were, we were a small business, but we were profitable. And so what do we need to do to sort the cash flow out? And he said, well, you're profitable, just grow the business. So that's what I did do. I, I've got a, a marketing guy who, who loves cold calling. I hate cold calling, so I, I gave it to him. And he grew the business by around 20%, I believe, um, in about two to three months, which was great. We went out celebrating. We hit massive targets. We were re really, really happy. However, a few weeks later, I was seeing my cash flow take a massive nosedive. And that really stumped me. I didn't understand why that was. Because my, my simple understanding in business, you, know, you buy something for a pound or, or a dollar, you sell it for $2, uh, you've got you know 50p or 50 cents uh, expenses. So you make yourself 50 cents or 50p profit. That's my sum total of understanding back then. I didn't realize that yeah, you've got to look at your balance sheet properly. So you need to understand debtor days, you need to understand creditor days, stock days, you need to understand your expenses, your cost of sales, all that kind of stuff. And what I did uh, inadvertently was look at the top line, which was the sales, and look to increase that without actually first going into the balance sheet and sorting out my debtor days. Because I thought I was getting paid 30 days um, after the date of invoice. But actually, when looking into it, I was getting paid 55 days. Whereas I was paying my suppliers 27, 30 days or so. So I had a massive cash gap, which I wasn't aware of. And so by increasing sales, all I did was make this gap worse. And so I, I had to then make a decision. Do I fight this? Because my bank balance was getting less and less and less. I had to make payroll, I had to pay suppliers. And so I had to make a choice. Do I continue fighting this fight and understanding what cash flow really is and how it works? Or do I give up and get a job? Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I, I stuck around, fought it, we got through it. Uh, and so I wrote the book to help owners understand what cash flow is, how it works. And I also created a, a cash flow simulator, uh, which will help uh, predict what your cash position will be like in 12 months time based upon your current set of financials. And that's free to use uh, on my website. So um, that was all came about in looking at um, what I would want as a beginning entrepreneur in my hands. And uh, so, yeah, the, the, the six keys are the first one is debtor days, which is your account receivables, credit days, stock days, expenses, cost of sales and sales, which is the final and uh, sixth key. So I'm trying to match those with U.S. terms. I um, accounts receivable, I get right. They, you guys have uh, different phrases for some of the stuff. Uh, would you happen to know the U.S. phrases for those? Um, it could be accounts payable for credit days, okay. uh, stock days, or inventory days, um, okay. uh, or work in progress, okay. and then expenses and cost of sales. Yeah. Okay. The, the, I was just clearing that up just because there was one of them that you said that you, you cleared it up. It's like, which one's accounts receivable? Which one's accounts payable? Um, and it just, in the in the moment, I was like, wait a second, we're using different terminology here. <laughs> like, uh, what's very common is somebody will say turnover uh, when I'm talking to you guys in the UK. Here, when we say turnover, it's people leaving the company. So your turnover wow. is like your, um, I don't know what you call it, it's your Revenue. number of employees. Like, if you have 100 employees and you lose three this month, right? That's your turnover. It's like how many employees are you turning over, right? Uh, to where it's, you know, what you're using the phrase turnover for is revenue here. That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Employee turnover. Yeah. We, or we call it employee churn. Yeah, um, yeah. And, then, and then revenue or, or sales or, or turnover is for revenues, your top line. Let's talk about, um, okay, we, we've got a company, we're up and running, our accountants out there, and that's the number one reason that the uh, business books look like crap, uh, to be honest, is you're only paying your accountant, your CPA to do your taxes, mm -hmm. right? Um, and a lot of CPAs and accountants, that's all they know how to do. Uh, bookkeepers and stuff, they just know how to, like, like they haven't, they've never been a controller. They've never been an in-company accountant. And I think that's a mistake. It's not a mistake to have a great person that's expert in taxes. I think it's a mistake not to have a CPA or financial advisor that knows 
this is what goes on a balance sheet. This is what goes on an income statement. Here's how you do cash flow analysis. I think, you, you know, I, I talked to over 200 plus businesses that last year and probably 40 or 50 this year so far, uh, just been doing a little slower because of the move and everything. And, uh, I'm surprised at how many business owners that are doing million, two million, three million a year in revenue don't even know what a class cash flow statement is. They understand the word cash flow, but they can't tell me what it is. And uh, you know, and it's important. Like one of the guys, like, oh no, everything's cool. I was like, do you have, do you understand your cash flow and your cash? Do you have a cash flow analysis or anything? He's like, no, I don't know why I would need that. And uh, so the, we get a little deeper into it. And I was like, okay, you're doing really good right now. Is there any time of the year that really slows down? He goes, yeah, I know by, I forgot what the date was, like October. Let's just make up one because I forgot what he said it was. So October, if I know by October 1st, if I don't have 400K in the account to pay all my employees for the winter, I'm in trouble because it gets real slow November, December, and sometimes in January. And then we start picking back up. I said, that's the importance of your cash flow analysis. You need to see what's cyclical, you know, what's coming so that you know, like, you know, that walking in the door because you've been here for 25 years or whatever it was, 23 years. I said, I wouldn't know that walking in the door because you haven't done the analysis and can show that to me with, you know, we stumbled upon it in conversation, which is great. But uh, for anybody that's running a business day to day, uh, especially if you're running an early business, not knowing your cash flow cycles. Is, is extremely dangerous, right? And, and uh, maybe it's the trial by fire. It's one of the lessons you're going to learn fairly quick if you don't already have it done. <laughs> I like totally to, agree. That's the lesson I learned, and that's why I wrote the book, because I don't want people to go through what I went through. Right. So um, tell me a little bit about your your advisory. Like, What is it that you do on a day in, day in, uh, day, in day out? Do you buy companies too, or do you uh, uh, primarily advise? I initially looked to to acquire companies because I really enjoy kind of buying it, doing it up and, and selling it off. I love it. I bought a demolition company back in 2014, sold it in 2019. So I love it. I love doing stuff new. I knew nothing about that industry anyway, so I thought it would be a good, good trial. Anyway. I, want, I want to do so, that just because I don't want to tear shit up, right? I've been good. looking at demolition companies like, you don't know anything about the industry. It's like, yeah, but I get to tear things down, right? Like problem with it, that would be is I'd find myself in the back of wanting to tear down the building I mean, uh, yeah, at least once or twice. So I have a, I used to, I came from the real, sorry, I didn't mean to jump into this one, but I came right. from the real estate world and I have a friend who has a, a backhoe and some other stuff. And I, I told him one day, so, you know, if you ever have to tear down a house with that, if you can give me, I, I can run anything. I grew up on a farm. I can run any piece of equipment that you can imagine. Show me where the controls are. Give me 10 minutes in the, in the middle of an empty field. And then I can, I can control it. And, uh, you know, I've, I've run backhoes and skid steers and stuff like that. But I said, you don't have to pay me for the day. I'll just come over. Just let me tear something up. Right. So I, I think I think when you say you bought that, that's I was actually looking at that industry for a little while just because I think it's kind of a I don't know. It's the childhood fantasy, like just like playing Godzilla and tearing things down would be fun. Yeah, I, I, I thought that idea. Then when I got into it, I realized then it was like in the U.S., but the U.K. health and safety is nuts. So you can't just go tearing things down, unfortunately, even though I wanted to. <laughs> so uh, you were you, you bought that. And then what? how did you get into the advising side? I've been an advisor for about uh, 12, 14 years already on and off. Um, okay. So what I'd like to do is to at least practice what I preach. I don't want to be a consultant who does pure consultancy. I want to actually be in practice and actually do it myself. So I've been on and off with advisory throughout my up the last 12, 14 years. Um, but when I sold the demolition company, I actually really enjoyed the, the whole process of buying and selling and, and being very strategic in that. And so I went on a bit of an acquisition spree and I spoke to a couple of hundred owners looking to exit, uh, of which I made no acquisitions. Um, and that's because the companies were either unsellable um, they weren't ready for exit. The owner themselves weren't ready. And the valuations they were placing on the companies were was ridiculous, sometimes 62 times EBITDA, which is, I couldn't even mathematically work it out. Um, so it's, so I got frustrated with having t these conversations, well, the same conversations over and over again with these owners. So I thought, what, what, did, what, what have I been doing all these years that allowed me to buy, start, grow a company and exit it without too much hassle. 
And that was really distilling what I was doing. And that's having a business plan, a personal plan, a financial plan. I knew where I was going with all three plans and I, and I executed it. And so that led me into, I think these owners need help. Um, you know, I'm seeing too many owners either looking to sell but can't, or they have some personal problem they need to deal with, be it health, whatever the case is, and they need to exit and they, and they can't. So I kind of distilled what I was doing down on paper and built a methodology around that. But at the same time, I was working with accountants or CPAs. And I, I think, with, I don't know what it's like in the, in the US, but in the UK, the, the government's making uh, tax digital, which basically means that when it comes to your compliance, so your tax return, your VAT returns, things like that, that's going to be pretty much automated. So the, the need for an accountant is going to lessen, although there will still be there, but the, it's going to be more of a, a commodity-based product rather than I need your services sort of thing. Um, following that, though, I have found bookkeeping to be an absolute disaster. Um, people are not keeping accurate books. So when we run reports, we get garbage. And so we need to make sure that I think the baseline, absolutely fun, the foundations of any business is bookkeeping. And that needs to be 100% correct so that we can have viable reports to make viable decisions. And so it's working with accountants to really stop being accountants and be their, their client's trusted advisor. Yes, you do the compliance stuff, you tick the boxes, but your clients need more help. So they need to make sure that the bookkeeping is correct, the nominals are correct, everything's coded correctly, so that when they do the reports, they get valuable data from which the owner and the accountant or the advisor can make proper informed decisions. And so that is what I'm doing now. I'm really working with accountants to help work with their clients in a very structured, orderly fashion or a very strategic, focused fashion so they can help their clients grow and exit successfully I'm also working with owners themselves directly because I enjoy that kind of interaction where you go into a business, see what it's like, help the owner understand where they are and work out a plan to help them to, you know, achieve their, their goals. So, so I'm working with owners directly, but also working with accountants to help them stop being basic accountants and start to be their trusted advisor. I love that. So I caught something in that conversation there that you said that if your taxes are going to digital and they're kind of automated and you said you didn't know how it was in the United States. I kind of smirk at that because we love our loopholes here and our politicians happen to be invest, you know, usually in investors and uh, business owners themselves. And I won't say that I won't go as far on my live show to say that all of our politicians are corrupt, but uh, I, I highly, highly doubt that, we ever do anything that is like a flat tax and automatable and stuff just because, um, you know, the people running the show here like their loopholes and like their ability to uh, avoid things and, you know, outsmart everybody. So there's ego play of like, you know, they're always saying billionaires here that don't pay their taxes. And it's just because we have so many loopholes and so many write-offs we pay, they pay taxes. They just pay uh, payroll taxes and stuff like that, but you can avoid, uh, even the biggest companies can avoid, like, you know, a lot of th what people think corporations should be taxed at here. And uh, so I just kind of smirk when you said, like, I don't know if the United States is going to automate it. Like, yeah, not until we clean up our politicians. <laughs> Let's talk about, uh, I mean, that world of your businesses, your books is absolutely foreign or alien or just. To, to most business owners, right? I guess yeah, I was talking about it earlier, the accidental entrepreneur, they know how to make a widget. They know how to sell a widget. Nobody showed them how to get books. How do they make that transition? Like, how do they, I mean, I know number one thing, probably hire somebody, but like, how do you hire that person that knows? How do you know, you know, if you're that guy that only knows how to make the widgets and know how to make the sell, how do you know somebody knows to keep the books right? I mean, what do you, what well, do you look for? Well, that's what I'm trying to fix. Um, as when, when you're starting out in business, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and you stick to what you're good at, which is making those widgets, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, and when you start showing spreadsheets and numbers, some people go blank. Uh, other people love them, horses for courses. Um, mm -hmm. But I think this is where the accountancy profession should step in because at least here in the UK, you have to have an accountant to sign your books off. So accountants have access to those clients. Mm -hmm. It's a question of, 
do those accountants actually want to step into the advisory space and actually offer high value to their clients? Um, and it's and again, it's, it's, it's an education piece. So either in a, in a perfect world, the accountant will be very forward thinking, very upfront mm-hmm. and say, look, I can do your, your accounts, no problem, but you realize I also offer advisory services. So I'll do more than just your compliance stuff. All you do what I did is you make mistakes and you learn the hard way and you realize actually, you know, there's a lot more to business than simply making widgets. So I want to make sure that um, owners get educated. So my, my two books hopefully will help do that. Um, but also, I think to get best and the, the most traction out of the whole thing is to train up accountants who are forward thinking, who want to stay on their front foot to assist their clients in a very proactive way. Like I say, stop being the accountant and be the trusted advisor. And I know some people aren't great with finances. It's absolutely fine. But that's where the accountant or the CPA should step in and say, hey, this is how we do it. And this is how we need to create your books. And it goes back down to bookkeeping. And most accountants don't really like bookkeeping. They farm it out. Um, but I think bookkeeping is the foundational part of business. If you don't have clean, clear books, clean data to work from, you, you can't get proper reports or decision-making done. So it's really about educating accountants to accelerate this whole thing so they can be the the trusted advisor but at the same time i want to get a message out there to all the entrepreneurs that it's more than just making widgets it's it's a lot more to it this is this is a vehicle to fund your dreams this is a vehicle to see you into retirement potentially or a vehicle to see you to your next project so we need to make sure the vehicle is running as smoothly and as efficiently as possible And, and so yeah, it's an education process. I don't think it will happen overnight, but I know being on your show, for instance, hopefully, and what you're doing is also educating people as well. So hopefully with all our combined efforts, hopefully, um, people will get educated. Let's take this from another angle. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, and uh, I, I jokingly uh, refer to myself as the, uh, you know, the standard greedy capitalist pig, but uh, it's in joking. Um, it's what creates jobs and stuff. Mm. But um There's an opportunity here if you really look at it, right? There's a lot of businesses out there that are just not sellable by most buyers' standard. Um, I recently had somebody on the show who is kind of a forensic CPA, and he has a service of, you know, you give him a messed up set of books, and he'll put it into something to order, and he can you know, clean that up. So my thought process here, and I'm looking at some of these, instead of just turn away everything that just has ugly books, is... Is there a diamond in the rough here, right? Um, I know last year during the uh, big roll-up we were doing marketing agencies, we turned away some because they're just there was a mess, right? And they were profitable; they looked profitable, um, but you just couldn't tell where things were going. Where money was, you know, ending up. You know, owner was using the account as a personal bank account kind of thing. If it's profitable, it's got a great product. The market shares out there, they've captured the eyes of the consumer. They have a loyal customer base. You know, there might be an opportunity here. There, I think I think there is an opportunity here to uh, say, you know what? I'm going to go out there and look at all these companies. And if somebody hands me a messed up set of books, I'm going to have my little team put it together. And what should the books look like if they did it right? <laughs> right. And then, you know, hey, I get a discount because they didn't do this part. And that's just the nature of business. What do you think about that? You know, that angle of it is, wait a second, there's an opportunity here. A lot of times these guys can't work for another three or five years. They need to sell, right? And rather than let them, you know, dissolve something that had merit, um, you know, play Humpty Dumpty and see if you can't put the pieces back together, right? So, I love that. And it's I, my only come, come back on that would be, in my experience, when you try and do that, owners view their companies like it, like their baby. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you start to question how beautiful, ugly that baby is, you're going to start getting a reaction. Yeah. And I'm finding when I'm wanting to kind of delve into the, the books a bit more, in a bit more detail, at least here in the UK, the owners tend to clam up. They don't want you to investigate or to look for the potential in the business because that means opening up the cupboard, as it were, and they don't want that. 
um, I also find that people are very, for some reason, very loyal to their accountants because as their family accountant, it's been doing their, their dad's books, their grandfather's books. It's been there for, for years and years and years. They can't leave the accountant because they could offend the accountant. And to get the, the, the books properly, they kind of won't give it to you in the first place. So there's a lot of mistrust in that. And they almost are too scared to let it go. Now, I don't know what that, why they're scared, but um, when, we, when we do try and look for the, the diamond in the, in the rough and, and in the haystack, it's difficult to get the information because owners are so closed with it. Mm-hmm. And they, don't, they won't allow that to happen. In a perfect world, I would love to say, yeah, here's my accounts, here's my books, sort it out, do some investigation, see what you can do. But to get to that point, there's going to be a lot of trust involved. And at least here in the UK, owners don't trust people very much. They keep they they really, they keep the, their cards close to their chest, and it's 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 a tough one. But yeah, what you what you say is actually spot on. That would be in a perfect world. But um, yeah, what I'm finding here, it's it's tricky. You know, uh, I've like I said, I'm still pretty new here, and uh, but I, I I'm not having a problem. Like once we've built rapport, a lot of times, I honestly think a lot of times people approach the whole business buying, um, you know, adventure, or what do you call it, process uh, from a bad angle. They jump on the first call and they start talking, what's your revenue, how many employees you have. Um, don't, I don't do that. I, I'm not even, I don't, if they bring it up, we have that conversation, right? If it's natural. But, uh, you know, my first thing is build rapport. Tell me your origin story. How did you create this company? What's your biggest challenges? What are you working on right now? Um, you know, I, I like to ask things like, hey, you know, out of all the things you could be doing right now, what has you on the phone with the guy who buys and sells businesses? You know, wh- you know, what problems are you trying to solve? Because my job is to not just to buy a company. My go- job is to figure out where are they trying to go and what are they trying to accomplish? And if that aligns with what I'm trying to do, then we make something work. Uh, if not, then that's okay. Right. But, um, I think too many people are far too often trying to jump into being very direct and, and, and business owners are okay with it. But if you, if you take that approach and you don't have that deep rapport when, you know, I require, like when I'm looking at business, I require, every, show me everything your accountants, ever, accountants ever did. Right. So your last three years of balance statements and corporate tax returns and stuff. And if you're, at that level where we can't determine whether it should be seller's discretionary earnings or EBITDA, I want your last three years of personal tax returns because I know for a fact you'll skirt and twist and you're, especially if you have a broker involved, um, not picking on brokers or advisors, but they're trying to make the most money they can for all parties. The books and the performance and all the marketing material make it look bit better and you might I wouldn't say lie. That's a harsh word. You might embellish those documents a little bit to make it look good, but most people don't have the cojones to do that on their tax returns, right? So I require last three years of tax returns for, for all, and and when we get past the LOI, uh, I had one guy tell me no. I was like, look, that's like none of your business. I was like, look, it is my business. You're you know this is a pass through business. Almost everything it makes goes to you, and it's how I correlate the books you gave me to what you know, are you, what you're telling me is the same thing you're telling uncle Sam's how I kind of do my due diligence. It's just a trust thing, right? It's normal in this. Almost every, every buyer is going to ask for this. And he goes, well, I'm not giving it to you. I have other assets and stuff. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not going after those. I'm not interested. I have other assets too. Right. <laughs> so, but yeah, I can get that. There is some, but more often than not, I think it's, and I have to step back when the only time I've ever, two times I've got pushback for them. I actually realized I jumped into that conversation because they brought it up, right? Uh, hey, I'm in a hurry. Can we do this? Like, are you serious? You know, let's, let's see you're serious really quick. And we had not built that rapport, right? Mm-hmm. There's no trust yet. I can see, um, you know, I think for the next year here when I'm out there evaluating businesses, I'm still going to take a look at the ones that, you know, hand me then I ask for their financials. They start sending me uh, Excel spreadsheets, right? I used to reject those off the, like, if it's not a report, I was like, man, you know, generate a PDF report from your QuickBooks if that's what you're using, but don't send me Excel spreadsheets because I, you know, you could type anything you wanted in there. Um, I want something that looks like it came from a system that actually, you know, does your accounting. And, uh, but now I'm just like, okay, that's step one. It's a piece of information, accurate or inaccurate. 
uh, it is it is a piece of information and there's a story to be told as to why you handed me that piece of information, whether it's accurate or inaccurate, there's value in in the analysis of it, right? No, Talk I, about I, go ahead. No, go for it. So um are you, do you own any other businesses right now? Or are you still actually uh, looking at other? I mean, a lot of these guys I talk to, advisors like, yeah, I have these two other things. Like me, I, I always, I tell, I'm, I'm, I'm open about everything. I have a real estate portfolio, and I have a, uh, I have a pest control company of all things, 1,800 miles from here, right? My guys run it. It's a, uh, uh, and uh, I get on the phone with them regularly. But uh, it's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'm sitting in the redwood forest of uh, Sonoma Valley, California. So uh, right in the vineyards and redwood trees. So, uh, but, um, that said, um, do you have any other businesses right now or? Yeah, I've got a, a very small property portfolio, which I'm building up as a, as a pension pot, really. Yeah. Um, uh, my wife's self-employed. She, she works as a, a literacy consultant. She actually goes into schools to help teachers teach better English writing and, and, and reading. Um, so I'm working with her on that. Uh, but then I've spent most of my time really creating the tools and methodology that goes into, into exit planning, uh, into an online portal that accountants or CPAs can use and uh, what business owners can have access to. Um, so I spent most of the last probably 18 months making that digital. And we're in the last final phases of beta testing now and we launched in September. So I've got my first training course with about 13 accountants on there looking to um, take on the methodology that they can use for their for their clients. So at the moment, not yet, but I am looking to acquire more companies in the probably Q2 of 23. You got to give them some type of your own certification, right? So they're a so-and-so certified accountant, <laughs> right? So uh, but then, then we can actually come on the show later next time. You, you, we'll have you on there another, you know, next time this, you know, this time next year or something. You can go, hey, now we got to, you know, if you want to get this done right, you got to have a so-and-so certified accountant, right? So how do people find you and your information out there? Like um, where, when this course is available, where, where, where would somebody find that? You can contact me uh, either via LinkedIn, which is on the link below, um, mm -hmm. or if you go to uh, businessbydesign.co.uk, you can uh, contact me there or just simply email me cliff at businessbydesign.co.uk and I'll be happy to send you more information uh, about the various training courses and how to become a, an accredited advisor so you can go help uh, your clients achieve SSX exit using the, the tools and methodology that I've created. Cool. I've asked a lot of questions. Uh, can you think of anything like, many should ask me this? Is there any topics I missed? Is there a question I missed? Or no, I don't think so. I think uh, what you're doing there is great. I think the the whole the whole aim, my whole motivation is to educate owners, to make them aware of what's out there, uh, and to also give accountants, CPAs the ability to work with their clients in a very structured and focused way. So, I think the the more we can help owners understand that there's more to business than making widgets, and to help CPAs and accountants that there's more to doing books and compliance work. I think the better. I think we can all help each other uh, to achieve everyone's success and everyone's happiness and, and make this world a better place. And, you know, from, for, as far as I'm concerned, a business is simply a vehicle to get you from A to B. And if we can make that vehicle as efficient and as quick as possible or in the, in the way you want it to, then, you know, it's a win, win, win as far as I'm concerned. So my, my whole thing is business needs to be an all round win. Otherwise, don't bother doing it. Well, we mentioned something earlier, and it's on my top of my mind right now because I catch myself entangling myself in this. Uh, somebody asked, you know, what do you do? I'm a podcaster, right? And I do so many other things, but that's the thing I enjoy the most. If you would ask my father what he did, he'd tell you he's a painter, but he'd do full-blown remodels and work at a paint factory making paint. Had the best eye for matching colors as anybody ever said. My father was blind in one eye, and uh, he could beat the computers at that paint factory matching colors, right? It was just impressive to see what he could do. The computer would tell him to do certain codes. He's like, yeah, it's a little off. He changes it himself. He'd dry it, and his would be right, then theirs would be a shade off or something. And um, But, you know, as an entrepreneur, and you're out there in this space, what do you think What do you think's the key thing out there? I know I get it, is that how do you, well, I guess the real word I'm looking for is how do we separate our identities from like, you know, who we are versus what we're running and what we do, because that's, that's something that happens a lot inside of this exit, this exit strategy is like, 
hey, if, if I'm not the widget maker, then who am I? Do you have, you, you brought it up earlier. Do you have, uh, when you're advising people and helping them, like what's your thought process on that? How do you deal with that? That's a, that's a complex question. Um, and I'm glad you brought it up actually. Um, it's about creating energy in what you do. Um, yeah, we're all trying to find this work-life balance and it's, it's, it's a tricky thing because it's, you're in constant motion to try and balance everything, but it's where you find your energy. And if you find your energy in business and working 70 hours a week, that's absolutely fine. Or if you find your energy in sport or if you find your energy in your family, that's absolutely fine. But I think every now and again, you need to stop and take a step back, assess your life, making sure that, you know, where are you heading? Um, you know, where are you right now? And are you heading in the right direction? Because if your ladder is against the wrong wall, you're going to be climbing up a ladder to find that's the wrong wall you're climbing up. So you need to just take a step back and say, look, where am I going? Uh, I'm currently on this path. Where is it leading? Is it where I want it to go? And just make those, those decisions based upon where you currently are and where you want it to go. And that's why I tend to take every 90 days a quick break just to see and assess where I am, what's happened over the, next, over the last 90 days, what's going to happen, what's my plans going to be for the next 90 days. And then once a year, I'll take a couple of days out to say, like, what's happened normally between Christmas and New Year is to look back and say, right, what have I achieved over the past year? And I've got two children aged 12 and nine. You know, what have I done with them? You know, are, are we building relationships? Um, where's my identity in everything? Is it in my kids? Is it with my wife? Is it with my business? Is it, you know, where is it? Um, and then look at the, the coming year and say, so where am I wanting to go? Uh, this time next year, what do I want to see? And it's just really about being very conscious of what you're doing and where you want to go. And so I think it's, I don't think it's, it's wrong to put all your energy into, into sport or into a business or whatever the case is as long as you can take a step back and just make sure that you actually are in the, the right direction, that you, you're heading in, in where you want it to go um, and you want to end up in a place where you don't want to be so and, and, and have regrets. Yeah. So it's all about just reassess, reassessing and stepping back from constant striving to, to take, a, a, take stock of where you are. It's interesting. A lot of people spend a lot of effort, time and money even coming up with a vision and direction for their company. But they don't stop and figure out what does that look like, a vision and direction for themselves. And there's a lot of power. I don't know if anything's more powerful than intention, right? Uh, directed intention, singularity of focus. I want to get here. You know, I personally, I know, and people even said this, if I set my mind to something, it gets done. You know, uh, you know and people are just shocked by, you know. My wife one day said, hey, you know, I kind of like to live in a tiny home. And I was like, all right, let's go get one. Uh, I was, we were going to Texas just for a little while. To, uh, I was volunteering at a self-help program type of thing, helping people out. Great program. But uh, we were going to go down there for two years while I did this leadership and executive training type of thing. And uh, so she, she wanted a tiny home. And I was like, it's cheaper than rent. Let's just go get one. Um, and a lot of people look at that and go, how do you do that? And it's like, well, you, you, there's a goal, you set a goal and you just have the, you know, like, you know it's a singularity of focus. Mm -hmm. I've run into business owners and people, almost anybody you can walk through on the street. If you ask them what they're, what are, what are your goals in life? You know, where are you going? What do you want to do? Most people don't know. That's the single downfall of most. And, and I catch myself this way, right? Sometimes I'm like, I just, I get up and do what I do every day. And like, did, did I, that I set a goal. Uh, and it's kind of funny. We talked about this cause that's kind of what I was doing last night. And what I'm working on right now is what does it look like for the next six months? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are my goals and my intention for the next six months for this show, for my business, acquiring business for, for the other projects I've got going on for the family. And, um, you know, that should have been done a long time ago, but you get in these phases where you're just doing what you're doing and don't realize that you haven't set that, that vision. Um, so, What's your thought process on like, what does that, you talked about the business plan, the personal plan and the financial plan. Um, is that, do you have them do that documented? Is that just something they do in their head? Is there an exercise book you give them or what, what does that look like? I'm curious here. Um, 
in in the when, when I'm creating the online portal is mm -hmm. we can send the owner a, what I call a value assessment, mm -hmm. and in there is a, a four part questionnaire that you answer, and you you will score yourself, your financials, and your business against that, mm -hmm. and then that generates five reports. It generates mm -hmm. the, the results of each of those questionnaires. And, and will show your score and how you've ranked yourself. Mm -hmm. But then it also uh, converts and produces a fifth report called a master action plan. And basically it combines all four reports into one big report, but it puts them in order of how you've scored yourself. So if you score yourself a one, they list all the areas you scored yourself a one in, and the mm -hmm. two, the threes, and the fours, et cetera. And it gives you all the areas that you need to work on in your business, your personal and your financial plan that, that needs to be there for you to be able to exit correctly and so you take those, that entire document and you work on it list by or step by step over a 90 day plan over a 12 month plan so that you slowly become exit ready you slowly start to add value within the business you get yourself personally prepared uh, get yourself financially prepared and it asks you some key questions some some questions you may not have thought about or some questions you have thought about but may have forgotten uh, and it really helps to bring to the mind exactly that, yes, you can work 100 miles an hour in your business, but also you do have a life outside of work, outside of business. You do have a family. You do have your own personal space. What does that look like? What does your financials look like? And so it just brings to, to light where, where you are in those three plans. And we do that once a year to measure and monitor your performance and track your performance over time. And so the value assessment allows us to do that. And uh, so that's, that's a tangible and an intangible measurement of A, where are you on the journey, but also to show you by having an advisor work with you or coach work with you to show the impact they have on your business and whether they're actually adding value to the business or not, which I think is very, very important. Awesome. Well, we are hitting the top of the hour here. Uh, uh, is there any like, top point you want to leave everybody with? Something you're like, hey, if you don't remember anything else about the show, this is what you want. I want you to walk away with. I think the, the number one thing is to, if you want to, if you've got a business, start planning your exits right now. But don't just plan your exits with your business in isolation. Have a mm -hmm. business plan, a personal plan, and a financial plan. Work out what you're going to do with your business. You know how you go to exit it. Are you going to sell it, liquidate it, close it down? Um, what are you going to do between now and when you do exit? What are you going to do after you exit? And also, how much money will you need when you retire? Those are the three key plans that you need to have in place. So start planning straight away, but have those three plans aligned. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being on the show today. Um, one last time, how do people reach out to you? Simply by email, uh, cliff at businessbydesign.co.uk or the website businessbydesign.co.uk or on the LinkedIn link uh, at the bottom. Uh, all those will be on the show notes. So if you guys are listening somewhere, don't do, don't look if you're driving. But if you're not driving, you're you're, you're uh, you, you can actually if you're watching the video or something, I'll have my team put that all in the show notes. So all your contact information will be there. People know how to reach out to you. I appreciate you being here today, man. It was really fun. Um, I'm I'm gonna get off here and go view the ocean here and uh, spend my day. My I moved to a new location. One of the cool things I like to do is go meet other business owners. So I think I'm going to go hang out at the, this is a little town, a little vacation town of like 4,500 population, but they have a chamber of commerce here. So I'm going to go pop in over at the chamber of commerce and say, who in town should I know? Right. And just uh, kind of get out and meet some people. But uh, I appreciate your time today. And thank you for being on the show. No, thanks for having me. It's been great talking to you and enjoy the rest of your day as my day closes out. <laughs> All right. We're going to end the stream. Hang on for just a second. That's the show, guys. And I appreciate you for hanging out and watching us. Uh, if you uh, make sure you check the show notes, we do have uh, some stuff going on right now. We have a um, mergers and acquisitions meetup tomorrow uh, via Zoom. So all the M&A guys, if you're out there buying companies, selling companies, you're an acquisition entrepreneur. Uh, twice a month, we meet up, help each other out, move our games forward. It's just a business networking thing. You'll find that in the show notes today. Um, and then the uh, other thing you can find is we do have a Slack group. So if anybody wants to chat with us and all of our, our guests, you'd be you'll be emailed and invited to the Slack group also. So if somebody wants to talk to one of the speakers, some of them elect to be here, some of them not. So, uh, you know, we have some pretty cool people on there that you can reach out and just, you know, throw some questions up and get very valid responses from some really intelligent people on there. So uh, I appreciate for being here and that's the show. 
Hey, it's your host, Ronald Skelton. I want to thank you personally for watching the show today and invite you to call our new hotline, 918-641-4150. That's 918-641-4150. Call us and tell us about our show, ask questions, uh, suggest a guest, or even tell me about a business you have for sale and we'll reach back out to you. Again, that number is 918-641-4150. Call our hotline and leave us some information. Thank you. The Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind. The Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind combines the traditional peer to peer mastermind introduced first in Napoleon Hill's famous book, Think and Grow Rich, with accountability partnering, where your peers help you ensure that you set goals, take actions, and get results. If you want to scale, blow past roadblocks, and achieve success faster than you might think is possible, I suggest you take a visit over to tiepm.com. That's T. I E P M dot com and check out the investors and entrepreneurs professional mastermind.